Coming up on this week's show, Apple's biggest mistakes of the 90s. But Mega Drive gets a better version of Street Fighter 2. And we're joined by the groundbreaking programmer of 4D boxing, Total Annihilation, and more, Chris Taylor. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 234, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And it's that time of the week again, just before the weekend, our little retro gaming roundtable chat and, of course, keeping you up to date with everything that's happened over the last seven days in the world of retro gaming and tech and bringing you a very special guest as well. Now, before we get into this week's show, I just want to say a big thank you to all of the amazing comments that we had about last week's episode with legendary games journalist Jazz Rignall. I think it's fair to say that episode went down pretty well. Oh, it was absolutely awesome seeing the reaction. You know, we had tons of people commenting and we also asked, like, who would you like to see on the retro hour in the future we've had about 100 replies on twitter and it's really made me think about one thing so many people have asked for guests that have already been on <laughs> so <laughs> i'm thinking we've we're on episode 234 here you know there's a huge back catalog so i'm really going to get that guest list kind of updated and put online so people can cross reference that Well, the reason that we managed to get Jazz on, I mean, we've wanted him on the podcast for about, you know, about three and a half years. We've been like, you know, just randomly getting in touch with him on like various places. Didn't hear back, but then it was last week when one of our listeners actually tagged him in a tweet and said, why haven't you had him on? And then he replied and goes, I'd love to. So, I mean, sometimes messages just kind of fall through the cracks, but that was thank you very much to one of our listeners who actually managed to make that happen for us. So, you know, we were chatting before that there are, you know, so many guests out there that we probably don't even think of or people that we really want to have on the show that we haven't actually reached out to in the correct way. So if you guys have got anyone you think would make a really good guest or maybe someone who made one of your all-time favourite games, why don't you get in touch with us at Retro Hour UK on Twitter and we'll do our best to make it happen. I mean, Ravi works so hard to get these guests on and we do it week in, week out, but I'm sure there are people out there that would make incredible guests that are not even on our radar. And I've kind of got all the guys that I I know about and that I like. So we'd love to hear about other systems, stuff like the MSX, stuff like the Acorn. You know, systems that we haven't covered that much. There's got to be so many out there that we could do incredible episodes about that we just haven't thought of. So, yeah, we'd really appreciate any help you get with that, guys. You can get us on the socials at Retro Hour UK. Now, speaking of amazing guests, we've got another one this week. And this week... I put my feet up and enjoy it as a listener because uh, you guys did it this week. Yeah, we had uh, me and Joe doing the interview and it's Chris Taylor. Now, Chris Taylor is an absolutely legendary games designer and programmer. He's really cutting edge and he's done a lot of firsts in games. So he did Hardball, which was one of the old baseball games, but it had that 3D depth kind of perception. Also, Test Drive 2, 4D Boxing, which was on so many systems. It was the first... 3D head-to-head fighting game, Total Annihilation, which was that RTS that came after Command & Conquer, but was absolutely amazing. And then Dungeon Siege and Supreme Commander, which was the first multi-monitor game and the first multi-core game. Yeah, I I just loved how passionate he was about it, you know, and he was just really honest as well because of, you know, when we started talking about RTS games, he was just like, you know what? He was like, I love Dune, I loved... um, Command and Conquer and stuff. And he was just like, you know what? I was playing these games and just thinking, how can I do this better? Do you know what I mean? And we just got into this really like natural conversation about it. And it was just really, really interesting to hear. And it was just really strange doing it with just, you know, I don't do many of the interviews, but me and Ravi. So hopefully we'll see a few more of them. Um, You know, we'll let Dan put his feet up a little bit. I'm always up for that. (laughs) (laughs) So Chris Taylor, I'm looking forward to enjoying it as a listener as well, because, you know, I haven't heard this yet. So we're going to get him on the show in around 15 minutes from now. Chris Taylor will be our special guest. And there is still plenty of retro gaming news stories to talk about as well. I must admit, I don't know if you guys were the same. When kind of all this COVID thing kicked in, I was a bit worried that that was going to just kind of take over all the news and there wouldn't be many things for us to talk about on the show. Yeah, I thought it did for a while, actually. I think about a month it was kind of like video game surge because of COVID, rah, rah, rah. But um, it seems that the news has kind of changed and it's got back into the usual flow of talking about kind of cool little devices that are coming out, uh, cool little books and uh, new releases. One thing I thought was really interesting as well is before we get into the stories, I just spotted a headline the other day about how well the video games industry in general has done over the last like three or four months. And apparently in April of this year, it was up 73% over April 2019. 
in That's terms crazy. of spending on video games and systems. That is crazy. I mean, I think I read something along the lines of obviously uh, The Last of Us Two yeah. um, has obviously been out now for about a month, and I think it's already outdone some of the top top PS4 and PS3 game sales already because. I guess it's just everybody's at home just playing games. Yeah. <laughs> but I also think probably the devs can all work from home really easily. You yeah. Know, it's it's a job where you can just adapt. You just take your PC home, you know. Yeah, exactly. And we all know what like, you know, game development there's so much like pressure and hard work with that at the moment. Like you hear all these horror stories and stuff. So it must be really nice for them working from home. I mean, I'm working from home at the moment and it's been really, really nice. And I don't have that kind of pressure to put out games and stuff like that. So maybe that has something to do with it. I just think it's positive as well in the world where, you know, a lot of industries are really struggling at the moment. The fact that the video games industry is, you know, one that's actually shining and doing well. Mm. So uh, great work, everyone who's been involved. And of course, lots of retro gaming projects, uh, some of which we'll be covering over the next 15 minutes or so. Before we do, let's talk about some projects that one of the biggest companies in the world would probably rather forget about. Now, this is a story on techthelead.com. And this is all about products that Apple in that dark period back in the early to mid-90s, would probably rather forget about. It is their biggest failures of the decade. Now, they actually do give an honourable mention here as well to the uh, the 20th anniversary Mac. I don't know if you remember that. It was, it's nicknamed the TAM in Mac communities. I always thought that one was pretty cool, though. It was kind of like a, a flat screen with built-in speakers, and I think the, the audio on that was like a really high-end audiophile speaker that was built into it as well. Yeah, I was looking at this, and I was like, you know what? That doesn't look too bad, like, you know, the the uh, 20th anniversary one. Uh, but then I read the article. The reason it flopped is that it was $8,000. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good old Apple. Uh, well, there is a few more as well. Some were a little bit more affordable. In 1993, they brought out the Apple Power Seed now this was really cool actually i thought because i mean around that time i i'd had a cd walkman for a couple of years mm. and obviously like you know the cd rom revolution was really kicking off in 93 that's when we got you know games like mist and uh, alone in the dark and seventh guest all came out in 1993 and this was a kind of a cd rom player that you could attach headphones to and use it as a portable cd walkman or with a remote control just as an audio cd player as well it All looks right. so dope. Like, literally, <laughs> I'd love to have one of those in my house. Just kind of sitting there with the Apple logo. It it looks like a kind of Mega drive um, kind it, of device, It actually. reminds me of, like, a CDI. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. More yeah, CDI. It's got, it's, it's got that kind of, like, early 90s, this is the future. Like, this grey, <laughs> dark grey plastic shell of the future. But everybody thought in the early 90s, you know, when you see these TV shows and people have the moving monitors and stuff and you know, these high-tech gadgets and stuff. They've always got that dark grey shell. And, of course, it could play photo CDs as well, which uh, we all know what uh, a revolution they were. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking on eBay, $500 at the moment. <laughs> well, speaking of something else that wasn't a massive success that they thought was going to change the world, the Apple Newton, the Apple message pad, as they call it in here as well. Now, in honour of doing this article, I actually brought my Newton in to the studio. Oh, you really? actually, yeah. I actually read this and I was like, I bet that's something Dan has. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work too well on an audio only podcast but if you can hear there if i uh, just kind of tap here on the don't, screen don't do the show notes on the newton mate <laughs> <laughs> awful can you hear that oh yeah <laughs> yeah very vaguely uh, i mean the newton it's uh I, I, i've talked before on the show about <laughs> for some reason i always seem to go back to ryman's the stationers in, uh, in my hometown as a kid. Because we had a little thing on Saturday afternoons. I don't know if you guys were the same. Saturday afternoon, I'd always meet my friends from school, Ricky and Mandip, and we'd have a few shops that we'd go around every week, always be Dixon's. We'd have a look in Comet, our two local game shops, Chips and Topsoft. And then we'd always end up in Ryman's The Stationers. And that was where I saw Wolfenstein 3D and Doom for the first time, but also where I got to play with the Apple Newton. And... Like you said then, you probably wouldn't want to do like your schoolwork or anything on it because it was infamous for being a really bad handwriting recognition system, which they did improve in later revisions, but, I mean, it was infamously ridiculed in that episode of The Simpsons as well, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like Beat Up Martin or something. It says, like, Pick Up Mail instead. <laughs> eat Up Martha, I think. That's it, Eat yeah. Up Martha. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they're talking about the fact that it was um, $900 when it came out. But, I mean, you know, you look at these products and obviously that did go on to inspire stuff like, you know, the iPad and stuff later on. It was an ARM-based machine. So uh, in terms of what it actually went on to kind of inspire in the future i think it was an important product but obviously i, I a massive do failure. remember having some kind of pda i think everybody had some kind of pda that was like they used for about a week in the yeah. 90s <laughs> did you have one joe 
I, I didn't, unfortunately, but there was a lad at school in the early 2000s who had one of these PDAs. And I remember thinking he was like, he was the future because he was actually an exchange <laughs> student. He was an exchange student from Hong Kong. And I thought like he had this PDA thing. And I was like, he is like the man. <laughs> like, he's, he's 10 years in front of us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But what about the Macintosh TV then? Now, uh, whenever you see this online, people are like, "Oh, the Apple TV." I'm like, "No, this is a different thing." This was a Mac computer built into a CRT monitor, all in like this really nice charcoal black color as well. That had a television built into it too, and and it just did a picture in picture, didn't it? That yeah, the, yeah, a really looks, small picture in picture. It looks a little bit like a Vectrex to me. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> If they brought Vectrex out in like yeah the, the mid nineties, ninety three, yeah, <laughs> and it had, yeah, essentially it was a Mac with a, a TV tuner card, and you could watch your yeah, analog TV or content that you captured from another device in a small window while you did your work in the corner. Um, next, we had Apple's first digital camera, the nineteen ninety four Apple Quick Take. Now this was you know again another flop because the time they brought it out, other companies like Kodak it mentions were coming along who were obviously a bit more established in the traditional world of photography, they were bringing out digital cameras too. Um, but they're actually calling this the first consumer digital camera. And again, obviously a really influential device, but didn't sell very well. The quality of it was pretty bad. And again, when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, this was one of the first products he killed off along with the Newton. And then after that, in 1995, I know we'd all like to own one of these, Apple's console, the Apple Pippin. <laughs> I would love one of these, and they are fun to play at uh, events and stuff like that. But I'm um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure these go for a lot of money these days on eBay. It's interesting because I don't think Apple's taken gaming seriously till about nowadays, where they've actually got this new iPad keyboard and mouse, and they're kind of getting into that gaming area with with a nice new interface. But the Pippin really kind of wrecked them. You know, they didn't they didn't bother with gaming for a long time. Yeah, I mean, now obviously you can get them on the Apple TV. You know, they do games and stuff on there. But um, yeah, I mean, the Pippin was that weird time as well, wasn't it? Again, it was 95 pre-Jobs coming back. You know, it really felt like they completely lost the way there. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, again, I, I mean, I look at that controller, that kind of boomerang controller that it had. <laughs> does it have a tracker ball on it? Yeah, it's it got does, a tracker ball in the middle, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Even the biggest company in the world don't necessarily get things right all the time. So if you want to read that full list, I'll put it in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, you think back to the early 90s, and obviously when, you know, the, the beat-em-up craze happened, it was really like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter 2 were like the two heavyweights of beat-em-ups mm. back then. And I don't know about you, I also associate Street Fighter 2 with the SNES. Yeah, you see, I was reading this article that uh, Dan and Ravi sent over to me earlier today. And uh, so there's a new version of Street Fighter 2 that's been completed, um, which is kind of like the, uh, you know, the love child of a guy called uh, Gabriel Pyron. And it says in the article that Street Fighter 2 for the SNES seems to be like, you know, more kind of like, not popular, but people seem to remember that one a lot more. Well, for me, it was the Mega Drive. All right. I always played it on the Mega Drive. I did have a cousin and an uncle who had it for the SNES, but we had it for the Mega Drive. And I never personally saw an issue with it. But apparently there was quite a few issues with the, with the, uh, the Mega Drive one. The SNES one was always the much superior one. Now, there is, um, if I can find this, I'll link it up, because there was like a prototype that was kind of discovered of a version of Street Fighter II Champion Edition for the Mega Drive that I think Capcom had actually outsourced it to someone else, weren't happy with it, it got made again, and then I think they had some kind of deal where it was going to be an exclusive on the SNES for a while. I mean, this, this article I was reading was about 35 pages long, so oh, it's like a really <laughs> in-depth story. Uh, but there was a reason essentially why it was a superior game in terms of graphics and speed. And I mean, some people, you know, it says they prefer the sound of the version on the Mega Drive. But now there is a new version here, again, like you said, by a bedroom coder, uh, Gabriel Pyron, who's actually took essentially the best bits of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition, made a new version of it with a load of improvements and enhancements that essentially means this is a lot closer to the arcade version. And there is a video that he's made that um, is embedded in this article on Nintendo Life. And again, the video is about 20, 25 minutes long. But it does show you, like, you know, kind of what quite a big improvement the arcade version was over the Mega Drive version back then. Yeah, because I was, I was watching it, and at first I was like, oh, it just looks a little bit brighter and stuff like that. But as you actually get into the video, there's a lot more kind of like, is it differing effects and like transparencies? Um, and even like down to the life bar and the display and stuff like that, it actually does look a lot nicer. And it actually was quite reminiscent of the Switch version you know, that came out a couple of years ago, but running on the Mega Drive. 
But not only did he like sharpen up the graphics and stuff like that, he also redid like all the um, you know like continue screens when you complete the game, all the different stories and all the text and stuff like that. He remastered all of that as well. So it wasn't just the graphics; he's done like everything in the game. It looks like a lighter palette. Like the yeah. palette looks a lot lighter and brighter, where the original one kind of looks a bit dark and a bit, a little bit more muddy. But you don't like. I wouldn't say it looks muddy, but then compared to what he's done, it does. And also, apparently, he's fixed like a lot of bugs that are in the game as well, and also kind of rebalanced mm. some of the difficulty levels as well to make it a bit of a fairer game. So, you know, it looks like it's been a real like kind of love letter to Street Fighter, and he spent a lot of time doing this. And actually, he's given it as a, you know free download, so you can download it, but you'll need the. You will, you will need the original Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition to apply it to. It's essentially released as like a patch for that. So then you can apply it to the ROMs and then, you know, play it on your emulator or your, your EverDrive, something like that. So uh, I'll put a link to that if you want to give it a download. Always nice to see like classic games, especially when, you know, someone played the original and like, you know, have this idea of how they could improve it and then actually gone out and done it. I think that's really cool. Now, maybe you weren't happy with uh, using your original controllers on your retro computers. Tell us about this, Ravi, the Project Mouser. Yeah, so uh, the the Project Mouster, I think it's Mouster, um, is basically a tiny adapter that connects for the DB9 plug uh, to USB. And so the DB9 was like the Atari-style joystick ports that were on like Commodore 64, Amigas, all them machines. And, and, and pretty much like most of the old machines were yeah. DB9. And the thing is, these adapters have come out before, but they've been built for each individual system. So like you've had an Atari adapter, you've had an Amiga adapter, you know, there's a, a Mega Drive one that's probably come out. But this one is universal. And the size of it is absolutely tiny. Like they've they've got a D cell battery here, and it's smaller than the D cell battery. So they've just started to produce PCBs. And the idea is it's a USB A socket. Um, it works. Here is the claim on the highlight. So this is by RetroHacks from RetroHacks.net. It works with every mouse and every USB gamepad. Uh, the PS4 pad is also supported. Wow. It's configurable uh, for a USB drive as well, so you can configure the buttons, reconfigure it, which might be good for stuff like Amiga, you know, where the um, layouts are different to the, say, Mega Drive pads. And uh, it's got mouse emulation default modes as well. And, uh, yeah, it also works with flash drives, which is also opens up a lot of potential, and it's cheap, cheap and small, which... Uh, just looks absolutely fantastic. I can't wait for this to come out. You know, I think it's going to be good for as well. If you've got like, um, you know, like one of the the recreation systems, like the uh, the NES Mini or the the Mega Drive Mini, that haven't got like the original controller ports on there. Mm. So maybe you want like a new Mega Drive controller, but you, you want to use it by USB. That will essentially give you a way playing, you know, these new controllers on your original system. I imagine. Maybe, yeah, 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 definitely. Or if you had a sex changer, uh, which is. <laughs> <laughs> a kind of way of swapping it around then you could play it the other way around so you could you could probably have uh the opposite you know yeah and i think it is really good i mean looking at the list of things they've got here i mean they're putting config options in there for commodore 64 and 128 spectrums and like you said ps4 pad full support for all platforms including apparently the atari 2600 is going to have a special mode that will cover all the ps4 pad functions including like you know the touch screen stuff that's on there too so, uh, I mean, yeah, a lot of effort's gone into this by the looks of it. Looks like it's still kind of in the beta testing mode at the moment, and I don't think you can buy them just yet, but hopefully they'll be released for a pretty affordable price. Yeah, and it, it just looks cheap and fun. And like you said, I mean, it kind of does solve a lot of the problems. I mean, I've got, like, USB adapters for a few of my systems, but generally they're kind of, you know, a USB port, and then you've got, like, a, a long circuit board with a few chips in the middle, then the DB9 connector. And because, I mean, the thing you often find is if you've got, original systems the controllers can sometimes be as expensive as the machines themselves now can't they yeah yeah definitely and uh you know like if you look at the cd32 or something the original controllers my god they they go for a lot now let's talk about our good friends of bitmap books i mean they've been keeping busy throughout the last few months they're actually going to be bringing out a book that celebrates game boy box art yeah that's awesome um i really like the bitmap books um and you know he sent us a few in the past uh, for review and stuff and they've always looked really really good um so i'm excited about this one i i did have a game boy but i mainly played pokemon on it and i know game boy is a really good uh, really good system to collect for because it doesn't have the biggest library in the world and it's not the most expensive library so i'm pretty excited about getting my hands on this one is it coming out in november 
Yes, I believe, yeah, in November it's going to be coming out in. And um, it's actually written by one of the um, journalists who works on Nintendo Life. Oh, okay. There's a guy called uh, Damien McFerrin. He's, he's written the book. So, um, it, you know, it's got like a, someone who knows his stuff behind it. Oh, it's awesome. an interesting, interesting concept because I think the Game Boy is the, probably uh, one of the systems where I've seen the least box games because they kind of get resold or, or you just get the loose carts. Or your mum chucks them away or something. Yeah, yeah. So to <laughs> actually like <Joe's> see, <laughs> to see the boxes out there, you know, there must be some really beautiful designs that people have yeah. missed and uh, not really seen. So to highlight them is a great idea. The cover of the book looks absolutely incredible as well. And apparently the artwork for that's been done by um, Will Overton, who worked for Rare. Oh, oh, okay, nice. yeah. Yeah, I'm looking so, at it. Uh, no, that does look really cool. It's got like yeah, a so real kind of like anime Japanese feel to it, but like a modern take. Yeah, and there's loads of like different characters that you'll mm. recognize um, mm. if, you, if you're a Game Boy fan all, all around it as well. So, I mean, like I said, we're big fans of Bitmap books anyway. So, um, this, this is going to be coming out in November this year, just in time for the holidays. So, if you're thinking of ideas already, that's definitely worth a buy. Now, let's talk about another game that I'll, I'll admit I'm not too familiar with, but I know this is like a really sought after video game for Game Boy fans. Uh, this is a Game Boy Color game that came out really late in its life called Shantae. Now, this was, um, I want to say, 2002, I think you mentioned this came out in Joe, which obviously the Game Boy Advance was out by then. Yeah, so um, Ravi was telling me about this one. So from what I understand with Shantae, it came out right at the end of the Game Boy Color's life, but it was actually developed in 97, so it was in a bit of a development hell. So with it being one of the last kind of like system releases, as you know, like a lot of the time they, they, they're not kind of like, you know, not too many are sent to print. So they become these really sought after rare games. So from what I understand, it tends to go to about four, goes for about four or five hundred dollars boxed uh, on eBay. And apparently it is a really good game. But um, I know they re-released it for like the Wii U and Xbox Live and stuff. But like a, you know, a modern version of it a couple of years ago, which I think Ravi said was really good. Yeah. So um, it was called uh, Shantae's Risky Revenge Director's Cut. And like kind of a lot of the Wii U games have gone onto the Switch anyway. So this was a really easy kind of uh, port. But um, it, it's got some new modes. So there's like magic mode. So half your damage is kind of gone. So uh, you basically, it's a lot harder. There's a new kind of warp system in there. But the whole look of it is is really pixely. It's absolutely beautiful. And uh, I'd say it's one of the nicest platformers for the Wii U, but also the Game Boy Color version looks really exciting. And it's by Capcom. So they said they're going to release both of these titles. So there's going to be the Game Boy Color version and Risky Revenge coming out as well for the Switch. I wonder what that would do for the value, because obviously they're saying the Game Boy Color version, that it's limited run games that are putting out, it is literally going to be using the exact same artwork, everything from the original. So I wonder what that's going to do to the value of like the original copies from 2002. And if it's going to cause like some sort of, you know, like if it's if it's going to be able to, you know, you're going to be able to tell the difference between the two or if they're going to do something like it's going to be really clear that it's from limited games or something. But I think that's really cool that they are because it's not often you see like a Game Boy Color game or something from these these uh, companies. It's usually like an old game now coming out on PS4 or Streets of Rage 4 got a limited run on PS4 on discs so i think it's cool that they're doing that normally what they do is they put like their limited run games logo or something in the corner yeah don't they? so you know it's it's a different edition i imagine and maybe oh, the uh, the 2020 date on there or something yeah that's good it'll probably be the rights won't it so it'll be like the 2020 rights yeah uh, the, the 2020 rights will be on it and the 2002 rights will be on the own old yeah ones, that's yeah. a good point I mean, there is. I mean, you see like repro cartridges of like, you know, uh, Nintendo World Championship and stuff like that, don't you, that go for, you know, like $10 for the repro, but the original goes for like thousands. So yeah, yeah. I don't think it's going to change the value of those original limited run ones. But um, yeah, it's cool when they do this. So, I mean, especially if if you've always wanted this game and the only other way to play it was either via emulation or, you know, via like a flashcard or something, given fans of that game, like, especially with them in a good game as well. The fact that Game Boy Color owners can now get a proper boxed copy of it that looks like the original. And um, I think as well, from what I heard, they're going to be releasing the other games on the Switch as well, because apparently there was five games. There was Shanty that came out in 2002, uh, Risky's Revenge, there was the uh, Pirate's Curse, Half Genie Hero, and one last year, uh, Shanty and the Seven Sirens that came out. So apparently all these are going to be available on the Switch soon as well. So you'll be able to play all, all games on that platform. Well, I'll tell you how I found it. I was basically installing a ton of games for the Wii U. <laughs> and uh, there was a list of like top, top 10 Wii U games. And I was like, oh, what's this one on it? It looks really retro. And then I picked it up and like 
three hours later, I was still playing it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Recommendation for Ravi. So if you want to uh, give it a download or, uh, or buy a copy of that. Um, no pricing information has been revealed on this article yet, so hopefully it'll be affordable. Um, I'll put a link to that and all the other stories that we talked about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, before we get into this week's special guest, Chris Taylor, uh, let's just give a big thank you to our very loyal supporters, our incredible patrons. Now, we did actually do another patrons hangout on uh, Sunday night. It was loads of fun as well. I mean, I was showing off my Newton on that. I think we were, uh, were helping Joe catalogue his Sega games. I, the, uh, I was. I was, was going <laughs> I've uh, bought some catalogues for Super Nintendo and Sega Mega Drive recently, and uh, I was doing them. Um, and before I knew it, it had been like an hour and a half, and I was like, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was quite a long one. This, I think me and Ravi finished, well, what, about 10 past 10? I, I think, I we, think we ended up going on about mobile phones and like, what yeah. was your first mobile? Your first and we mobile were like, phone, yeah. talking about like Nokia's and, oh God. Yeah, really early stuff. I uh, fished yeah. out my iPhone 3 for my first smartphone. Er- Ericsson stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're so retro, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but it was loads of fun. And we do that every month as well. And of course, for being a patron, you can join us on that. It's just a bit of a free for all, bit of a hangout. And there are lots of other perks as well. You can find those and uh, support the show as well. That's the most important thing. If you do become a patron, but you are helping the future of this podcast and that every penny that we make goes back into the future of this show. We don't earn a profit off it or anything like that. It's all reinvested into the podcast. And of course, you will get a mention on a future episode episode in the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, thank you so much to Brian Condren, Chris Hull, Edward Fitzpatrick, Fabrice DeVille, and Ed James, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, you can sign up as a patron right now for the cost of a beer or a cup of coffee once a month. You can help out this podcast at theretrohour.com. Right then, next, we're going to get the story of some incredible games. I mean, I think I'll let you guys introduce this interview because you're the ones that did it. Me and Ravi are joined by legendary game designer Chris Taylor up next on the Retro Hour podcast. You are listening to the Retro Hour today with me and Ravi. We are joined by our very special guest today, Chris Taylor. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Chris. Oh, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, we have a question that we always ask our guests first, and that was like, what was your first memorable or kind of notable video game experience? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, We're going to go way, way back to probably like a Sears Pong and it and that was probably right around the exact same time arcades started showing up. So, you know, that was... uh, you know, games like uh, like Space Invaders, I think, Asteroids, Battlezone, all those types of games were coming in the arcade. And at home, of course, we had these really, really sort of simplified gaming systems like Pong, and then there was Breakout. And that was kind of the beginning of it. And I think that was right around 1976, 77. You were born in British Columbia. Um, what was the Canadian gaming scene like? Was it like a lot more home games or was it more arcades as you grew up? Uh, in terms of a gaming scene, wow, that's kind of a funny question because, you know, I was living out in the country and um, uh, games, you know, generally uh, it was arcades and, like I said, these sort of simple simple home, plat- home systems. Um, but when things really kicked in was around 7980, when I started to run into folks who bought compu- home computers where mm. Commodore PET was like the first home computer type system, you know, where the key and keyboard and the screen all integrated into one package. And a friend of mine, he, he, he literally, he had a, he had another friend whose wife, who, sorry, his sister was married to a guy who had one. That was how, that was how hard it was to get to know somebody who had a computer back in like literally 1979. And I got over to their house and I got sat down in front of it. And even though it was, you know, a Commodore PET with very limited graphics, very limited uh, com- computational power compared to the higher end custom built systems that were running in arcades, it was amazing. It was like, oh, my God, this is the greatest thing I have ever seen. It was it was completely life changing. And I can't emphasize that enough. It was like I could not for one minute, stop talking about the experience I had. Imagine the people around me. So my dad said, heard me talking nonstop about it. So he, he goes out and he buys me a PC 
from Radio Shack called the TRS-80. And it was a TRS-80 Model 1. And, and he, he comes home and he goes, go, go check out what I got in the trunk of the car. And, I, and I'm thinking, oh, he's, told, he's, he's got groceries or something he wants me to bring in. That's, that's kind of lame. And I go out and I lift the trunk. I guess you call it a bonnet, or no? What's the what's the or what's the uh, oh, yeah car boot? The car boot, the boot yeah. <laughs> the boot. Sorry, the hood is the bonnet, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> the boot. And, and and he and I open it up, and there's these boxes. And, and Radio Shack didn't have flashy packaging. It was cardboard, brown cardboard boxes. Like what? And I couldn't believe it. I I, I had to kind of like do a double, triple take. I was like, is this a computer? And it was, and it might have been one of the sort of like the more simple kind of uh, lower end, lower tech, frankly, less expensive. Uh, but it, it ch- completely changed my life. It completely, I set it up. And like my dad used to tell people, uh, after that day, he never saw me for three years. <laughs> uh, I just sat in my bedroom and I just wrote code and I and I played games. And the games were kind of like, taking little breaths of uh, oxygen to re, you know, to keep me going. And I just started on a, on a, on a path to basically start writing video games. It was all about video games. I mean, productivity apps, sure. Interesting, but no, no, it's all about graphics. It's all about doing things really, really quickly, optimizing code, uh, almost immediately getting into assembly language programming within 12 months and figuring out how to write a Z80 assembly code. Uh, so that was like literally the first jump, big major jump that I made. And then from that point on, it just keeps going and I'll, I'll stop. I'll pause there. Cause even graphics were a massive like jump back then. The Commodore pet had great games like adventure and stuff like that. But, um, it it must've been interesting to kind of get into the graphics area. And I know you were fascinated with 3d stuff so uh, what kind of 3d work were you doing on the uh, trs-80 oh man you know what there would be these articles in these magazines and they'd be written in basic because that that was easier for people but there'd be the odd game the odd article where they would they were literally embedding assembly language code into basic and they would they would you'd enter this all in as a string of data it was really weird and then it would push it up into memory uh, with these commands in basic, and then you'd, you'd pass control to the assembly language code that, that was uh, that was written up into memory, and it was it was to get this stuff to go really really fast. I remember uh, seeing an article in a magazine for a flight simulator from a company called Sublogic, and they I ordered this by mail from the United States because I'm up in Canada, and of course it took forever, but I couldn't believe the day it came. It was like something out of a uh, out of a Steven Spielberg movie where I'm literally running. P fifty one Mustang Cadillac of the sky, like I'm, I'm running, <laughs> I'm running through the house with this package, like this, like like I just won the lotto, and I'm plugging it in, and and that was three D, and it ran like crap, okay, because it was the graphics were low res, there was no screen uh, anti flicker, there's no way to test the vertical retrace, so you couldn't synchronize the screen, so you get this weird, you know, horrible uh, interference pattern that would move up the screen. Uh, and it was just awful, but it was amazing. Sort of like saying, you know, like, like the most awful experience ever was the most amazing experience, which I know it's kind of a contradiction, right? But it, but the, <laughs> you can <laughs> shove that together in your head. You get it, right? Because you're looking at 3D lines that are so jaggy and so rough and so simple but yet it, it's 3D and it's on your computer, so you you gotta you gotta appreciate. But then that just made me want to go learn how to do that, and and so then you know you had to I had to start buying books on 3D how to do 3D math, right? Because a lot of it you have to use something called like a you have to use a transformation matrix, and you do your projections, your translations, your rotations, um, your scaling all in one transformation. And of course, when you're a 15 year old kid and you're reading about 3D transformations, you know, your mind is kind of blown. It doesn't fit in a 15-year-old kid's head. At least it didn't fit in mine. And then I had to study it to death in order to figure out how it worked uh, until I could get my own 3D stuff running. And that didn't happen until I got my hands on a another Radio Shack computer. It was a PC clone called a, a color... Uh, no, it was a, a, t- a Tandy, a Tandy 1000 that had the the EGA graphics, and then I built a 3D editor, allowed me to build 3D stuff. And that's what got me the job 
in the games industry. So when I went to an interview and they said, well, what do you know about, you know, graphics and games and all that? I showed them this 3D editor that I wrote and they were like, wow, that's great. And they gave me, and they gave me the job. And was that with a distinctive software? It was, it was indeed. And it was funny because I'd written most of that stuff in assembly, like eight, 8088, okay, mm. 8088. And uh, it was all hand handwritten assembly. And I'd done work in, um, obviously a ton of work in basic, uh, but I hadn't written anything in C. And their, their thing was, well, we need C programmers. So they asked me um, if, if I programmed C and if I'd come in for an interview in a week to talk about it. Well, um, this is going back a step. And I, I lied. I'm sorry to say I lied and told them I knew C. <laughs> so I drove over to a friend's house. I didn't have the money necessarily to, you know, in time and to go buy a book on C. So he had a book. So I read it cover to cover, went in for the interview a week later and got through the interview just from reading the book, having never written code. And then they gave me a task. They said, you have one week to write a drop down mouse driven menuing system like that, that you see on a Mac. Uh, you have that, you have one week to do that on a PC and it was Monday morning. And the management said to me, uh, his name was his manager, great guy, Rick, learned so much from Rick. He said to me, I'll be back in one week. And if you have this thing running, then basically you keep your job. And if not, you know, then, you know, fail. Now, I don't know if I'd gotten halfway through or three quarters of the way through the exercise. They, they would have done that or given me more time. But I work nonstop until Sunday night. I got it working. And Rick walks into my uh, uh, cubicle on Monday morning and I had it running. And that was, a, that was it. The, I, my game career was officially off and running at that point. Well, with the 3D stuff, you kind of started your first title, which was Hardball 2, and it had a really amazing sense of depth when uh, the ball was getting pitched towards you. And how did you achieve that? Well, there, um, uh, it's a great question. So uh, even I didn't understand how, how this problem would be solved. And there was another gentleman there at the company. Uh, his name was Kevin Pickell, and he'd worked out uh, this idea that what you do is you project a 3D uh, model uh, onto the screen. It can be really, really slow. And then an artist can draw in the graphics, like the 2D image on top of it. And um, that, was, that was sort of like a way to get a 3D uh, projection on a, on a 2D bitmap. But what I ended up finding out was that like the back wall of a baseball game was critical. That back wall was everything, right? Because if that ball that you hit went one pixel over the top of that, of cleared, cleared that wall, it was a home run. And if it hit the pixel of the top of the fence, it bounced back into the outfield. So this was like to the point where I had to actually go and write my own reverse projection code to take a 2D image and create a 3D model. Now, what's kind of horrifying about that is you get a beautiful image of an outfield in this in this bitmap, but the 3D model that it that you had you were using underneath was was horrible. You would never want to render that in 3D because it, it wouldn't make sense. It was just built purpose built to represent that outfield wall, and uh, the infield, of course, is easy because it's on uh, it's on Cartesian coordinates. It's perfectly geometrically a 90 degree back to home plate, which could be a zero zero zero, or not home plate, but just behind home plate. Uh, where the uh, where the uh, the two lines from either side of the field uh, connect, so you can kind of get a sense that there was some early like mind bending math, which fed completely into Total Annihilation and then Supreme Commander. But you you, you see, this is where I developed a lot of my two D to three D tricks and um, and sort of my toolkit for how to understand and wrap my brain around this problem of user perception of a 3d world done in 2d it was it's 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 almost like it, we could talk and we won't because obviously that would be too much but we could almost talk for an hour just about that whole kind of thing because you know people's brains don't just automatically comprehend that right it takes a little yeah. bit of mental gymnastics to get there I, w I was looking at um, Triple Play as well, and, and that had a really kind of similar 3D depth thing, but on the Mega Drive, and that looked really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I'm probably not answering your question, but basically what, what you get is, is the game is taking place in 3D. 
at the end of the day, the ball is moving on an X has an X, Y, Z coordinate. It has velocities. It has friction. Uh, when it hits the ground, it bounces or rolls with a coefficient of friction, the air resistance. If I wanted to go completely nuts, I could have modeled the elevation of the baseball stadium and then changed the air density. Uh, I could have said, oh, it's a rainy day. Uh, the ball is going to travel, have more friction than if it's a, a warm, dry day. So like you could take it even further, but it would all work, right? It just wouldn't manifest itself as improved gameplay probably. Um, but those are all real factors. You also did um, Test Drive 2, which was a huge game. Did you have much fun making that title? Well, what, what Test Drive 2, I worked on the front end. We had this, we had this uh, you know, there was a core game and there was the front end. And what, would ha- what happened was I joined Distinctive and I was there a month and I was working on Hardball 2. And there was a gentleman working on hard on uh, test drive two. Okay. So okay. he, 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 he left the company suddenly. I think he, uh, I think he, he won the lottery or he, he inherited, I think it was, he her- inherited a bunch of money uh, from, from a family member and he decided to retire uh, at a young age and run or, and travel the world. I don't know how that worked out, but he left the company and he left a year's worth of code that he'd written to be the front end of test drive two. And uh, when they went to look at his code and to see if uh, they could uh, work with it, it was a mess. It was effectively a, a lot of code to do to, that wouldn't work. It didn't work. So they pulled me off Hardball 2 and they said, Chris, we need to ship this in a month. You have one month to get this, this front end fixed. You have to debug it. Mm. Well, me and uh, a, uh, another engineer uh, who, was the lead, who was the lead engineer of Test Drive 2, his name was Amory Wong. He and I looked at the code and we looked at each other, kind of like a comedy scene. And we looked at each other, shook our heads and went, nope, we're going to rewrite the whole thing from scratch. So I sat down uh, and working with Amory on and off throughout that month, we completely rewrote the front end for Test Drive 2. So all the gas station uh, score screens, all the intro graphics, the logo graphics, everything that happened that wasn't the actual core game experience uh, was rewritten in 30 days and uh, and the game shipped and it works. So that was kind of like a really good early success for me uh, to get kind of pulled in in a firefighting mode and uh, pull that off and then go back to hardball too. There was a bit of uh, trouble with test drive too when accolade actually um put a lawsuit out about using software libraries was this a bit of a headache at the time oh there there is there is so much there um uh back in those days uh the pc part of it was fine taking the game to the mac but what happened was is that sega they wanted to charge people to produce games for their platform so what a bunch of companies did I believe Accolade did it, uh, Electronic Arts did it. They reverse engineered the hardware, which back then sounded like some real magic. I mean, but today, of course, it would be a trivial undertaking with the sophistication of the uh, of the tools we have, the electronics tools we have to be able to read a data bus or a, an address bus and see what's happening and look at the chips on the board. But back then, that was pretty. It was pretty amazing. So. Accolade had reverse engineered it, and they wanted um, us to do a version of Test Drive uh, for the uh, for the Sega Genesis. And um, we we were just at the same exact time purchased by Electronic Arts, but had this old contract to fulfill with Accolade. So can you imagine? Now Electronic Arts had reverse engineered it, but it struck a deal with uh, Sega. They, they actually came to legal uh, legal terms where they were now a license, a li- an actual licensed uh, software uh, developer for Sega Genesis. And so now you have a company that owns a company that has a deal with another company that doesn't have a license. So you have a, you have a schism, you have a legal problem. So the way you solve that is you take the team and that in this case, it was Test Drive 2 on the Sega Genesis. And I apologize, the previous one was Test Drive 2 on the PC, that was mm-hmm. the first. That was like the major, the the the, the uh, flagship release of the series. And so, what I did is I moved into a clean room with some other, with another engineer and some other folks, and we worked in complete isolation. We worked offsite. We couldn't talk to anyone at the office. We weren't allowed to access any company resources. They literally gave us our paychecks and said, "Call us back when you finish the game." 
And then on that version of Test Drive 2, I wrote the sprite management system to draw all the in-game graphics um, in 68,000 assembly, hand-optimized hand 68,000 assembly. So I don't think any of what I've told you is uh, is a secret. I mean, it's, it's actually, uh, if it's anything at all, it's proof that we played we played uh, to the letter of the law, and right it was book, important. yeah, yeah, to do that back then, and it, we and we did it, and we got the game done, and it shipped. And hey, you know what? I don't know how the test drive two Sega Genesis uh, players felt about the job we did, but I, I thought it was a pretty decent game. <laughs> That's amazing. Have you tried out any of the later test drive games that followed the series? You know, uh, the, the, the Accolade, of course, uh, owned that IP, uh, even though it was developed by uh, Don Matrick and Jeff Sember, the original founders of mm. Distinctive Software. I believe in those days they lost the IP rights due to the way licensing went. And those IPs, uh, that IP stayed with Accolade, and Accolade went to other parties. They went to third parties to develop the, the game uh, in, the, in the later series. And I really didn't have an interest, a core mm. interest, in driving games, I was more of a strategy and sim game. I was playing SimCity, Populous at the time were two of my favorites. I just would go into the office to work on the weekends and end up playing Populous all night um, because it was just, I don't know, it was just crazy fun. I was 20, 22, 23 years old, you know, uh, and, and I don't know. I love games. So it's really, it's, you know, it's your weekend, damn it. You can do whatever you want on your weekend, right? <laughs> Um, well, my, my next question actually was like, how did you feel about isometric games and a fake kind of 3D that was coming out at the time? And obviously Populous uh, really stood out as one. Um, did any other titles stand out to you? Well, if, if you remember right around that time, there was a game called, there was maybe it was before it was called Z- Zaxxon, I believe. It was an arcade game that used a three-quarter isometric view for 3D. Mm. And we'd seen a lot of 2D, except for Battlezone. Battlezone was 3D, and of course it was amazing. Um, but when you when you go to the PC, 3D really hurts you. Re- 3D the only way you do 3D like in a test drive game is with with uh, with sort of uh, it's trickery, it's visual trickery, and you're using programming tricks that don't cost a lot computationally to get an illusion of 3D. Like the way test drive rendered its road to the horizon, it was less about 3D than about a bunch of 2D all stacked on top like reverse drawn from the horizon back to the to the viewer and to the front. And um, when you look at games that were doing uh, isometric, that, that was a good stopgap because you had a non-perspective view that doesn't warp and change, which means you can use a big scrolling bitmap. Now, when you have a big scrolling bitmap, you can break it up into tiles. And those tiles are highly, highly compressible because we didn't have a lot of memory back then. You know, to have 640K, uh, on those PCs was a big deal. And then, of course, it kept growing and growing, but you never had enough. You know, if you ask Chris Roberts, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you there, there was never enough. He pushed, he pushed PCs to the limit. Um, and, you know, we were happy with isometric uh, games because it kind of got the job done. But, man, the first chance, you know, we had to break it loose and to go to true 3D, we did – but when it came to total annihilation, for example, we were still with one foot in both sides of the of the fence. You know, we kind of had one foot in. Well, we don't really have a lot of computational power, but we really do hunger for true 3D, and that's where the total annihilation uh, core game engine was born, uh, straddling those two worlds. Wow, I mean, you also worked on a 4D boxing, which was you know massively ahead of its time in 1991. Was that hard to create back then? Um, yeah, that, that game has a great story. So Don Madrick was the founder of that uh, of the studio there and owned the studio. Uh, he, he, had a, he had a friend named Stan Chow, and they had this idea to do a, a boxing game in 3D. And so that was kind of thrown over to me and a, a guy named Jay McDonald, an engineer, good guy, smart guy. And he was the mastermind behind the idea that we could rotoscope or digitally capture the movements of real boxers that all sounded good so when i was in this arcade i was literally playing an arcade machine this was right at the very beginning i'm playing an arcade game and right to my right there's this guy with his face kind of smushed in a little bit like his nose was flattened against his face he's this young guy and um he uh i said to him 
because I'm kind of an extrovert. I said, by the way, you wouldn't happen to be a boxer, would you? And he turned to me and he said, he said, yes, I am. And I laughed. I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. And his name, I think his name was Joe Savage. It was just great. And I said to him, would you consider us digitizing you? I mean, talk about, talk about research, right? We could have gone to a boxing gym, but I found the guy in an arcade. <laughs> so we take, we take Mr. Savage and we, we get him wired up with these markers, which were just white. I think they were just white markers, paper or tape or something like, uh, like, uh, like hockey tape, white hockey tape. And Jay had this idea that if we take cameras and we put them 90 degrees apart and we, sh and we shoot video of Joe making these boxing moves, we could then take them into a, a system, a Genlock system, and we could we could digitize them over into a uh, into actual 3D wireframe that would drive the, the the boxers. Well, you in order to do this, you have to get rid of perspective because perspective warps your warps your uh, your data. So to do that, we've got a gymnasium at a school, and we placed the cameras as far apart as we could and put uh, the subject in the corner of the gymnasium and then use the zooms to zoom back in. So you filled the frame, but you got rid of perspective. So that's how you get a, a non-perspective shot out of a, in a, in the real world, you, you pull back and you zoom all the way in. And, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of neat. And so Jay rigged all this up and he recorded Joe throwing all these different punches, all these combos and hooks and, and John Wainers, you know, and all the, cause we wanted big exaggerated boxing moves. And uh, when we got it back to the office, uh, the artists were working to get this stuff digitized over. And it was such a pain in the ass that they said, well, you know what, now that we've got the reference video, we'll just hand animate it. We'll just, <laughs> tweak, the, we'll just tweak the wireframe mesh with our eye. It'd be the same as having a photo and then painting a, a painting an oil painting or a painting a picture off of a photo. You get a pretty damn. It's, a, it's very helpful, but it wasn't actual true digitization. But it, the, the 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 work would have evolved in years to come. Um, motion capture studios, of course, do that, and they have quite sophisticated you know systems to filter out noise and jitter and discontinuity where the where the uh, the the sensor loses connection with the cameras and the other sense so forth and so on but it was definitely ahead of its time uh i give full credit to uh to jay for being the mastermind behind that and what i did was i played an interesting role where i built the game around this 3d boxer these 3d boxers so all the sort of the gameplay stuff you know like winning when you win or lose who you get to play next how you work up the ladder all the front end all of that stuff so um, the sad part about that story was it took a long, long time because we were also uh, being, that was just, that was just the project before the purchase of electronic arts. So where distinctive software became electronic arts, Canada. Okay. And that happened during that project. So the game went from a, a title that was signed up for Broderbund software. If you remember Broderbund, yeah. uh, it was moved to electronic arts. So it had an ownership change and it had leadership and vision change. So it made it difficult, but we got it done. It took a long time, but we got it done. And, uh, you know, it was another sports game and, uh, that I, that I, I guess I put in my resume, you know, it's, it's quite interesting when you look back at it, cause it was like one of the first head to head 3d fighting games. And then you look at something like Virtua fighter and actually it's not that different from, um, the original kind of title uh you must have looked back and felt quite quite proud of that title yeah it's interesting definitely very proud uh and very proud of the definitely a team a team effort it was one of those games that kind of broke down the barriers and it and it showed you why 3d was compelling it was also a massive exercise in level of detail management because you could run that game on an ibm for original IBM 4.77 megahertz machine that had monochrome graphics in pure wireframe mode. So it's almost like the flight sim example, but in order to get a good experience, you wanted to get the frame rate up. You couldn't play a boxing game at five frames per second. You had to render it, you had to limit the graphics to just seriously terrible, just wireframe, like armatures, like just like 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 what kind of thing but it was it was the gameplay that shined through that so that was 
a great example that if you have core gameplay, the graphics do play a secondary role, but frame rate, frame rate is king. And if you ever played a game that you thought could be fun or might be fun, but the frame rate was five or 10 frames a second, you know what I'm talking about. You know that you just need the frame rate first. You can't, you can't have pretty graphics in lieu of a great frame rate. And, and some games would do that. Some games that have the most, just they would gush with eye candy and the frame rate would be so low. You're like, I can't play this. I, I, the game might be good, but I can't play this. So that was a really good lesson in that. So you moved to Seattle in uh, 1995. What inspired that move? Well, I, I, Shelly Day, she was the producer of Hardball 2. Mm-hmm. And she, had, she, she was living down in California, and she ended up moving away from Accolade and going to a company called Lucas, LucasArts. And yeah. she met Ron Gilbert, the creator of uh, the Monkey Island and Maniac Mansion game. And they partnered up, and they moved up here to Woodenville, uh, just outside of Seattle, and they started a kids' company called Humongous Entertainment. Well, it was the end of 95 when I said, you know, I really need to change the scene. I'd been at Electronic Arts or I'd been at Distinctive Slash Electronic Arts Canada for seven or eight years. And I thought, wouldn't it be good if I could just break away and start my own company and do some simple things, you know, do some conversions, we called them, Mm -hmm. ports. And I called Shelly because I'd had, I maintained a relationship with her and after when she moved around and I said, I'd love to uh, see if you had anything I could help you with down there and I can do it from home here in, in BC, in Canada. And she said, well, why don't you drive down and meet Ron? I'd never met Ron. I'd heard about Ron. Of course, Ron, his name was on the box of Monkey Island. It was, he was very famous back then. And when I came down to meet Ron, he said, why don't you move down? Why don't you join Humongous Entertainment? And why don't you build the game you want to build? What game is that? And I said, well, well, now, if I'm going to build a, build a game that I want to build, not another, not another sports game, not another baseball game, not another, you know, because I built, by that time, I had done triple play baseball up in Canada. I built uh, virtual stadium baseball for the 3DO. So I built three baseball games and a boxing game. And I was burned out on sports. I, uh, and uh, I never really actually was a sports guy. I mean, just to be clear, right, like I was – never playing the sports games in the arcade. I was always playing the, the shoot 'em ups you know, the, whether the, some kind of combat game. So when Ron asked me that, I was like, oh, man, uh, I would do a game like Command & Conquer. I've, I've been playing Command & Conquer. It's, it's, it's super fun, but there's a bunch of stuff in there that we could really take to the next level. You know, for example, we could do it in 3D. But we mm. could do it in 3D, but with a 2D rendering system so that it looked like 3D. But underneath, you know, it was the baseball. It was the baseball thing. Let's do that to a, to a real-time strategy game, which, by the way, when I said that, nobody knew what a real-time strategy game was. It really <laughs> hadn't, even, it hadn't even really hit, the, hit, the, hit the, the, what do you want to call it, the zeitgeist. You know, it wasn't a word in people's heads. They're like, a real-time what? And uh, what's real-time? And, uh, and so he, he said, yeah, build it. And that was total annihilation. I built total. And I built. I built the. I, I, I. That was the design, and the, I ran that team, and 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 really, it was a, it was my. It was a big massive pivot for me. It was where I was. I went from building something that someone told me to build, to building what I wanted to to build or create, um, and that was that was a, a whole new chapter in my career. Well, I heard you were a huge Dune Two fan as well, and how much did this title kind of influence your development? It's an excellent point. Um, I was playing Dune 2. Uh, a friend of mine turned me on to it, and he said, you got to try this. And by the way, it was pirated. It was a pirated copy. So I went out and I picked up a copy years later to to alleviate my guilt. <laughs> but going back to when I was 14, I paid for everything. I paid for stuff. Um, so I was, you know, I, I, it was the odd thing that snuck onto a floppy disk here or there. But I was not a pirater. Um, I had a friend who had a massive, massive C64 collection of all pirate. I don't think he ever paid a nickel. Uh, so, of course, I, here I am playing this game called Dude 2, and I love it. And I'm like, oh, this is terrible. This is terrible. These guys. And this was Westwood Studios. And by the way, uh, fast forward to the future, I'm pretty good, pretty darn good friends with Lewis Castle, one of the founders of Westwood. And I've told him this story. And he, 
<laughs> and uh, so we, we uh, I was playing Dune 2, and I thought, Dune 2 is pretty amazing. But when I heard about Command & Conquer coming out, I literally counted the days to when I got my hands on it. And when I did, I was like, whoa, this is great. This is way cooler. But it still has a few things that it's missing. There's still stuff yeah. that we could do. So that that's how Dune 2 kind of played into that. So that, that game, Command and Conquer, made me uh, leave the Amiga. I was like, Dune 2, this is amazing. CNC's coming out on the PC. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Amiga was pretty amazing, you got to admit. Um, oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, Joe, go ahead. So, yeah, I was going to say, that kind of takes us into our next question. So, like you say, you know, Command and Conquer and Warcraft 2, you know, really took RTS games to that next level. So, what did you want to do? What, like, How did you want to improve on that? What did you bring to the table? One of the things that there was a couple of things right off the top. First of all, was the 3D. I wanted the, the shells and the guns that were fired. Mm-hmm. I wanted those the, all to happen in 3D. And I wanted it to be an emergent simulation. I didn't want it to be a predictive kind of a, it wasn't, the, the command and conquer wasn't a rock, paper, scissors. But if a cannon fired, it didn't hit things. It went straight to its target that it fired on. Uh, it was all very determinate. I wanted this um, predictive. I wanted it. You can't call it randomness because it's it, there was nothing random happening. But it was like when when a when a cannon fired, you didn't know if it was going to hit a target or not. The target could be moving. It could have shifted direction. Uh, you could be behind a hill. The projectile could end up connecting with the hill, and you could have this gun firing away. Futility having all this, you know, whacking away into a mountainside. The I wanted 3D. I wanted uh, guns to be able to fire off screen. I wanted you to be able to fire across the map. I wanted more strategic interplay. I wanted different units that moved at different speeds. And I wanted to bring in the naval component. Naval warfare is great. So I wanted air, land, and sea. And I wanted big maps. And I wanted bigger games. Uh, and I wanted more, frankly, more chaos and destruction. I wanted, And so the trees would catch fire. And I wanted wreckage, battlefield wreckage. So that when, you know, you, you, you look at a battlefield, it's strewn with wreckage and that wreckage becomes cover for you to shoot from behind that cover. Uh, it becomes impediment. Um, you know, there's a bunch of things that I never got to, which is like having bridges that you had to defend or, or take out. Those were things that I, I wanted to get to. So there was a lot to a, to a full blown strategy game that was uh, not there in Command and Conquer, but Command and Conquer is still a, uh, an amazing game, a classic game. It, it, it was so much about it. Uh, probably one of the biggest things that I I, uh, I loved but uh, didn't love at the same time was the beauty of the units. The units were beautiful, but that meant that they were pre-rendered and that meant that they had these fixed positions, like you had 16 facings or, uh, you know, I think it was 16, maybe 32, but it was probably 16 facings. And that meant that you had this, this unit would pop from position to position and the cannons couldn't actually really aim properly at their targets. So there was a lot of visual discontinuity, but the units looked great. So I was in this difficult spot. Like I had to make a game that had beautiful units, but at the same time um, they would be able to be geometrically exact. And so the the trade-off was you had to kind of find this, this way of making these, real-time generated polygonal flat shaded kind of u- units look good and i think we did it and it was because the the artists were were talented and they created character like the peewee uh just a character um and and and, it, and there was a lot of character throughout the game's design i mean all the way up to the krogoth if you remember the krogoth it just was this really neat iconic just a real iconographic um unit and you never right i never wanted for anything else uh and then we took that of course and we blew it out completely on supreme commander and supreme commander forge alliance and and supcom 2 we took the whole super unit mega unit experimental unit we took it all the way i think i mean into the crazy land which was great you've you've kind of really took me back there because i i totally forgot about that whole targeting people somebody moving and then you just left shelling somebody some random piece of land or a a, a tree or a hill um you you did some great kind of modding stuff um with total annihilation what what are some of the great community mods that you've seen 
Yeah, total annihilations modding. Um, I know you didn't ask me this exactly, but like the reason why it was moddable was because I'd written those baseball games. And those baseball games had teams that you would load to run, you'd shove teams into the sim. So in Total Annihilation, it was kind of like, imagine that. It was a baseball game, except that it was a strategy game where you fed units and map data into a sim, into a, into an engine, and that engine simulated whatever it was given. And so because of that, uh, you could create more units at a whim. We had the weekly, we had the unit of the week, which was really, really great for driving continued um, uh, what you would call today, in today's language, you'd call it engagement, right? Because if you're looking to play that next game on the shelf, you're like, well, wait, a new unit just came out for free that I can play with, what? And then, you know, you kept people engaged. And um, that was because of the architecture of the engine. The engine was data-driven. It was data-driven to the point where it would just look at the hard drive and it would say, hey, there's data, I better load it up. So it was an honor system because if you put junk in that folder, you'd get junk. I mean, you'd get you'd crash the game, or you would the game wouldn't work or not load. But um, I mean, you, you know that was a that that was a leap of faith, and it worked. And modding really really found its home in a game like TA. And then of course we we took that whole modding principle forward in other in other titles. Um, but, uh, it gives you a bit of an idea how it came about and why, why we did it in the, you know, and, and it brought life. I mean, those games, the, both TA and Subcom are played today because of modding. I believe it is because of modding. After that, you then founded your own company, Gas Powered Games, eventually. Did this free up time so you could carry on working on titles you enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, we just we absolutely worked on the first game we enjoyed. It was uh, what we wanted to make. I was playing Diablo, and Diablo mm-hmm. was like a repeat in a way. Now, I have to admit, doing an RPG game was kind of my second choice, but I didn't want to get into legal ambiguities. I knew that there was a there was a litigious it was a litigious industry. Um, people would sue. Uh, there was a lot of concern around you pick up and leave a company. A team of people goes with you. You create another game that's a competitor game. You could be in a you could be in a legal situation. Yeah. But if we built an RPG, there was a clean break, and there was well, clearly they didn't steal secrets. They didn't steal code or anything. Um, so when we founded Gas Powered Games, we we chose RPG because we we loved RPGs, action RPGs, not yeah. the slower paced kind of you know trickier uh rpgs that kind of uh the turn based yeah that well thank you yes turn based Mm. uh there were some action rpgs that were 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 almost like they had one foot in the turn-based world like Baldur's gate which kind of which people really enjoyed as well so really you couldn't go wrong back then it felt like uh it was an rpg you, you there was an audience it was a huge if you looked at the pie i don't know back then it was probably like 40 or 45 percent of the pie and for, sports were like 4%. It was re, Sports were really small. I mean, I'm making those numbers up, but you get the idea. And then there was action and there was arcade. And so anyways, RPG was big and it made a good business case. So we, we worked on uh, Dungeon Siege with the idea that we were going to bring some very, very important technology, you know, uh, big pillars, really big changes. And the first one, the, one, the biggest one, other than it being 3D, uh, was that it would you'd never see a loading screen after the game started you were in you were in and you moved around in this world and it all just loaded dynamically from there on so we had this view frustrum if you will and as you slid around inside this massive massive world it just loaded uh the data uh on the front edge of this frustum frustrum and then on the back end it has to unload it so, you know, when you think about continuously streaming worlds and you, nobody ever nobody ever thinks, well, you have to get rid of stuff. Well, what do you get rid of when you want to free up your memory? You have to be, you have to have algorithms and you have to have intelligence around the, in the code that decides, well, I'm going to throw that away because I don't need it. Uh, and then the player turns around and goes back the way they came and that same stuff you just unloaded, now you're loading again. So, you know, that starts to impact the way you design the worlds and the way uh, the, all the systems come together and work together. So that was an exercise in technology 
um, almost playing a, a role right beside gameplay. Um, but that was kind of my, if you look at my, if you look at my, my career, if all the way back to hardball two and all the mathematics and all the projection code, you look at the boxing game, you look at, um, you look at, uh, total annihilation, you'll see that technology was partnered with gameplay all the way through. Whereas some designers are really, are really focused on design, pure design, storytelling, characters, the music, color palettes, you know, they really get into the artistry of the game and they let engineers figure it out. Go figure it out, guys. I'm over here in design land and, and I know you'll come through or give me enough that I get my vision, but I was in the code. I was writing code and that, that made that I was, I was finding synergies that were more tightly coupled um, than just being kind of in an ivory tower designing and hoping folks could deliver it, um, if you know what I mean. And, and you were also kind of keeping the pace. Like, I remember one thing I used to do would be build up a huge army for a battle in an RTS and kind of start taking the army out and everything would lag. Like playing Supreme Commander, you had thousands of units at the same time. How did you kind of achieve that without uh, completely crashing everything? Well, um, you know, and to credit for those those games, obviously go to the engineers who worked on that. The team was huge. I think we had 60 people working on Supreme Commander. Um, although TA was at the end, it was close to 30, but it wasn't all engineers. I, I think we might have had 15 or 20 engineers on Supcom. I mean, when you're making a game like an RTS game and you know that it's a game that's going to have thousands of units potentially moving at the same time and shooting at each other and projectiles are flying and you've got an Intel model that has to constantly be checked and updated every time a unit moves, you know your code has to be really efficient. So how do you make efficient code? You look at the problem, you try to build uh, solutions that uh, execute in terms of clock cycles, uh, but you use memory uh, to, to optimize code because you can trade memory for code execution speed. Um, it's like a slider, you can kind of move it back and forth. Um, you know, you limit the complex mathematics. You know, when you start to look at things like a distance algorithm, you know, you don't take, you don't do a full Pythagorean theorem where you take the two sides, square them, add them, and find the square root. You compare things that are squared against other things that are squared, saving you a square root function. Now, today, those square roots are pretty fast, but back then, we went down into the, the nuts and bolts of every single part of that to optimize the, the living crap out of it because we knew that it would, you save those pennies, they add up to dollars. Uh, and as you know, even after we did that excruciating amount of optimization, you could still kill it. I joked that you could light a cigarette off the CPU. It was so <laughs> hot. And, and, and of course, the big uh, Intel and AMD and, and all the other, they loved us because we were pushing the boundaries. We were pushing the limits and that's causing people to go out. Do you know how many emails I have received over the years where people said, damn you, Taylor, I have to go out and buy a new PC every time you release a game. That, that, is like a, that, is like a, that is like a quote that would be the amalgamation of like hundreds and hundreds of emails that I've received where people are telling me that they got to go and spend another two or three grand every time I release a game because they know that other machine that's like a year and a half, two years old and won't be able to run the game. <laughs> you, you were driving hardware sales. I was driving <laughs> hardware sales. Well, uh, funny you should say that with Supreme Commander, you know, from what I know, that was the first game with the multiprocessor and multi-screens. People must have been blown away by that at the time. Yeah, I had to have the uh, the multi the multi screen. What did I call the? Uh, what did I call it? That I can't remember now. I'm getting old. That multi display. Or yeah, I, I forget. It was it was the idea that yeah, and then in Supreme Commander, it was uh, when you architect a game properly, um, you can render any any number of views. What happens then is you realize does do I have the seat? Do I have the power to push all those views? We're seeing that today with VR, right? You know, like to render something at 120 hertz, high resolution, right? Like it takes a beefy, beefy system to do it. And back then it was the, the early days of really taking gaming and pushing uh, the number of views. And it was pretty darn, it's pretty darn cool. Um, 
if I do say so myself. I I I don't see multi display games uh, today. Like it's funny, it never really caught on, unless I'm mistaken. I can't think of one single game in in recent times that I've seen on Steam that ran on on two screens. Unless, uh, yeah, it's, it's more kind of stretched, isn't it now, or or like. All, all one one image, but on like three screens rather than separate screens doing different things. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know if you see any. Let me know. Um, I I'm, I'm working on this 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 new this new project, and of course, it's n number of screens. You log in on your iPad, your phone, your PC, uh, on any operating system, and have a view into the game. Well, what are you up to nowadays? Like, what's your new project? Well, but well. Um, it, to be try to be concise um years ago like back in 2016 i left wargaming uh, and wargaming of course is the company that i sold gpg to gaspard games to um in 2013 um kind of the pc it was a, it was a tough road there for a while which maybe we don't need to get into we'll save that for another time but after wargaming i decided i wanted to get back to code because as you as you evolve in your career it's very difficult to stop this powerful force of constantly rising. Uh, you know, there's this thing called the Peter principle, which is where when you get good, people promote you. And when you get good again, they promote you again. So you end up finding yourself in a management role or an executive management role or a, a GM role. And I was the GM at Wargaming. And I wasn't touching code. And I really wanted to get my hands back into code. I love programming. It was the thing, maybe it's a childhood thing, you know, I programmed when I was 14. I programmed for all those years. My successes were built on my programming and I wanted to go back to that. So I started Kanugi in, um, in, in, in earnest, working on it about the middle of 2017. I needed to take a break. I'd been, I'd been working professionally for almost 30 years. And so I took um, about nine months to really decompress and I, and I started to get into Kanugi, and and then I lo- started looking at the web browser, what it could do. Started looking at cloud. A friend of mine said, "You know, you really should look at cloud." And I said, "Okay, yeah." Instead of just running a web browser where you download the code, because I had two problems that I had to solve. I had a performance problem. I couldn't get things to run very fast in a browser, as you can imagine. Browsers are are used like JavaScript, and JavaScript is okay. It's decent. It's actually faster than I ever thought it would go with all the work that Google has put into it um, with the V8 engine and so forth. But it wasn't performant enough to run like an RTS. So when a friend of mine mentioned the cloud, I said, oh, if I run the whole sim up in the cloud and I build a gaming platform, I would then be able to just render the graphics in the browser. And that would also solve my other problem. I had two big problems. And the other one was security. If you put something in a browser, someone can simply go and break into the console very easy and grab the source code and they'd be running it. They could take it and do whatever they wanted with it. And, you, you know, how how this business is, they would be off in every corner of the world. You'd never know it. Well, uh, when you run something in the cloud, and you run it behind a security uh, layer like HTTPS or a, a, any kind of transport layer, which means that people can't can't get 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 to it. You can just basically run the sim in the cloud. So that's the premise behind Kanugi. I run the game's simulations in the cloud, and I render them in the browser. Now, the the people say, oh, oh, you mean like Stadia? And I go, well, no. Stadia (laughs) renders in the cloud. I know, right? Like, I'm not trying to be mean to those people who ask that. But I am, I am, I recognize that it's confusing. So when you run something like Stadia, it renders it to a display in a memory, uh, a surface, if you will, um, and then it compresses the video very quickly with custom, very highly optimized hardware, and then it shoots it down as a video, and you're watching a video play in real time on your device. Well, Kanugi's system is to render it locally on your device. And what you end up getting is you get way, way faster. Uh, you get way lower freight uh, latency and you get, so you get much higher responsiveness. And if you click and you drag the screen around like an RTS game, you get instantaneous millisecond microsecond responses. You get no latency whatsoever when you pull the view around because it's just, you're, you're getting updates to the data model uh, from the SIM, but you're rendering your live view locally. 
So to me, this is the future model. Um, they can say what they like about Stadia and all the other uh, cloud rendered games, but the future is local render cloud sim. That's my. That's where I'm putting my money down. <laughs> Well, Chris, it's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. And it sounds like you're applying your coding skills to the web world now. So hopefully we'll see some kind of future stuff based on this uh, cloud gaming as well. Yeah, if you like, you can go and read a bit of the story I've written. The website's very simple, very basic. I I put the website together to be very lightweight, almost feel I, I wanted it to kind of have a retro feel convenient for me because doing something more than that would take a lot of time and and energy for a website but you can sign up for the beta i don't know when that beta is going to get started covid has kind of set me back um a little bit changed my focus a little bit but if you like you can sign up for the beta and at some point i will get that beta going and you can see what i've been working on awesome we'll put that in our show notes for everybody to check out thanks so much chris thank you it's been a lot of fun appreciate your time